I'd like to call to order this uh, work study for Independent School District 624 4 with the current police call roll. Beloy here. Chapman here. Ellison here. Faye here. Mullen here. Newmaster here. And Wilson here. All right. We'll uh, move into our first discussion item, which is the solar and energy installation. Mr. Wall. <coughs> Good evening, Chair Wall and members of the board. Uh, for the past several years, our building operations coordinator, Dan Rozier, has been working toward looking into um, solar options for the district as a means of reducing our carbon footprint, um, reducing the amount of energy we're pulling off the grid, and potentially saving districts some money in energy uh, expenses. We've looked at several options, and we uh, have an option that we're particularly interested with, or interested in, and have a few guests with me tonight. Uh, Chris Sibos, President and CEO, and Rich Regas, Senior VP of Business Development for our uh, Ideal Energies, and they're going to share an opportunity for the district to reduce our carbon footprint and save some money over the long term. So, welcome, Rich and Chris, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, right there. So uh, we founded this company back in 2010. Um, I run the original rebate program to UX Energy called their original Solar Rewards Program. And uh, since the uh, inception, we've done 300 of these commercial installs, about half of them with public entity nonprofits, about 75 schools to date. Uh, and the rest, uh, the other half with for profit customers all over the place, like uh, Schneiderman's Furniture, all their locations. And, uh, it's just been a nice, uh, uh, nice uh, nine-year run working on this stuff, and uh, we're excited to be working with the district here. Uh, I don't know what you want to add? Um, uh, the, what, 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 where does everybody kind of start? I'm trying to have a little timid share some information, and um, I'm happy to go over and back with Scott what we're talking about. Is that yeah, we're just walking through the that? process. Okay, okay sure. sure. All right. So what we've been doing is we've been installing solar arrays using miscellaneous rebate programs like Richard mentioned for the last several years. And there's a, a rebate program in the state of Minnesota called Solar Rewards. Um, last year, uh, that statute was changed. It was changed up to 40 kilowatts again. And what it does is it allows us to get over a 10-year period um, for each kilowatt hour that's generated from a solar array. There's an eight cent payment that comes from the utility each year. And so um, that's what our, our business is founded around, is leveraging different pieces of opportunities inside of the made by the legislature and utilities to install solar in different places. Um, we usually do business with like customers who um, are you know, uh, in business, so to speak, and they have tax bills and all these different kinds of things. The way to make solar work is leveraging all the different pieces to pay for a system so you can pay for it and then save money on your utility bill. So um, when we're usually doing transactions with like for-profit businesses and stuff like that, we have to leverage tax benefits and tax credits and rebates and bundle all this stuff together and then people pay you, pay us, and then they do it over time to get these things. And when you're in the public sector, there's really not an opportunity to do that because these incentives, et cetera, aren't available like tax credits can't be in schools and all these different pieces. So about seven or eight years ago, we started a program, um, which we uh, started with Ridgefield School District, um, and we've done business with a whole bunch of school districts thereafter. And what we've done is we've created a, a, a uh, well, what we do is we, we set up a system now where um, we have solar arrays where all these tax benefits and all those things are able to be leveraged by us as a company. And you're able to own the solar array as a school district. Um, behind the scenes, we're monetizing these rebates to come over 10 years. We wait to get them. That helps to pay for the system. We're able to monetize this tax credit. You get a 30% tax credit when you um, uh, put a solar array in. So in order for us to leverage that, I'm a managing partner of a tax fund, which is part of my partner's little national bank. And I basically run a tax credit for them so we can leverage tax credits through the bank and monetize them to help pay for these projects. Um, and the school's contribution to it is to pay for a fraction of the price by um, paying for the energy that comes out of the solar array over time. So when we're doing this, our goal is to leverage all the different pieces and ways a company to get them. And what we do in turn is we have a solar array which is owned by the school, and then behind the scenes we're, we're the tax owner of it, not the actual owner of it, but 
but as a tax firm, we can leverage all the monetary incentives and pull them all together. So what happens is at the end of the day, um, we set up a structure so the energy that's produced from the solar array over time, that you guys pay for that energy per unit that's generated over time. And um, our goal is to make sure that when we're doing that, that we actually provide economic savings to the school district. So the rates, when we, we bundle all these things together, and we look at the fraction of what the school is paying, um, pay for like less than half of the solar array over 15 years. Um, and then after that, the solar array is basically the schools for thereafter. And then from there, you get free energy from the solar array. And when we provide this, we um, um, are really kind of uh, very interested in the things that we can do for the school systems. So um, our program has been set up with some primary objectives in mind, which are um, one is to, you know, a school wants to own their solar array. Two, they wanted to save some money along the way, hopefully. Um, three, they want the upside of um, having a solar array on the building. So once you get through like a payback period, all the stuff that comes out of the solar array for the rest of its life is free. Um, and then we wanted to couple it with education. So what we've done as a business is put together all those components into a package that we've worked in all sorts of different schools with. Um, and um, our process goes something like this. We've been through a lot of these steps already. Um, we've already worked um, with Tim and Dan over the last year. And we have these rebates secured for many of the schools already. That's kind of a thing we need to get now. We're able to get last year's rebates, which were a more favorable rebate because they dropped the rebate off since last year. Um, by 25%. By 25%. So we have that all locked up and secured for all the different schools that we um, work with Dan to identify and Tim. And um, uh, at this point, um, we're pretty much in a, in a goal position. We've worked to get paperwork um, put together with Jay Squires, who's your attorney, and we got that through this morning. Um, we worked with Tim to share with him, excuse me, Dan to share with some of the uh, energy impacts of what it would look like with the school and how we'll be displacing some of the consumption at each site. Um, we put together and shared some of the educational materials that we use to help, you know, teach kids. And, um, and we really love to do this with you, like we have some other districts too, and we just love to answer questions or anything that you have about what we're doing and how we can get there. I, yeah, go ahead. How long do the solar arrays last? What's the, you sure. said long time warranties, but what is that actual warranty? So the warranty on the solar is different warranties. Um, there are one, two, there are three primary elements to a solar array. The rest is just electrical wiring into your building. The way these work is it's a solar array, which is solar panels. They sit on your roof. Um, they're held together by metal racking, which is aluminum. <coughs> the racking is held in place by cinder blocks, so there's no penetrations at all on school. It's just held down by weight, okay, and it lies on the roof. Solar panels have a 25-year warranty with them. Um, the second piece of the equipment is something that is called an inverter. Remember, a solar array produces like battery. It's a bunch of batteries connected. So it makes DC power. So in order to make it useful inside of the school, we have to make AC power. Uh, power um, AC um, power. And you do that by running it through something called an inverter. And an inverter is basically a box. The solar array goes into it, and now it becomes three-phase power, which is the kind that goes in your building. And we connect that directly into your you know, building electrical system. So electrons from your roof can be used in the building before they're pulled out from the grid. So that's how you get the reduction in consumption. The inverters have a 12 year warranty on them. Um, those we can buy a warranty for about $700 and extends that out to 20 years. Um, there's a, something called, and the cost of those is about $1,500 that they had to be replaced at some point in time. Um, there's two of those per system. Um, the other uh, piece is called a power optimizer. So what we do when we put um, solar arrays on top of um, buildings, um, you need to be mindful about Christmas tree lights. Remember, remember Christmas tree lights when we all grow up, you take one light out, the whole string dies, and you can't find it, you don't know what's going on, it doesn't light up. Solar's just like that if you don't use very high equipment. So um, what we use with this equipment is um, something called the power optimizer, and it works with that inverter. And what it does is it takes all the solar panels and it puts them together and has them work in pairs, so they work optimally together. And it takes them all and it puts them together in, in parallel instead of series. Parallel means if you lose one panel or one part of a panel or a leaf falls on it, the rest of the thing works, it's not actually covered by snow. Those pieces have a 25 year warranty with them. And so that's, you're basically working with um, you know, 25 year warranties and then an inverter, which is one piece of equipment that after about 12 to 15 years has to be replaced out. Um, like I said, you can get a replacement. 
replacement. One uh, bought an extra one now would be fifteen hundred dollars. But what happens is we tend to provide warranties with them when we buy them so that we have a twenty year warranty as part of the program. So um, when you get past, I think it's thirteen years on these, you have free energy that's generated from the system. And so that that's a wonderful you know bucket of, of you know revenue to help pay for that and pay for teachers and schools and books and all sorts of different things. So our, our program is built about you know working through a period of time to you know um, get that done and then turning over the best part to, to the school we're done. And I think there's a twenty five year warranty on the panels. Yeah, it's twenty five. Mr. Wilson? Yeah, I've got two questions, one financial, one technical. Um, financially, when you said eight cents per kilowatt hour, is that what we generate? That's or is it only the excess? That's the, that's the part that Excel Energy over 10 years for each year. So we wait through a year, and then based upon the prior year's energy production, there's a rebate that comes to Excel Energy, which is eight cents. Over the course of um, the 10 years that it's paid out, it's about $33,000, $34,000. We wait to get that over 10 years. So we wait to get that as it comes. Okay. So we're kind of motivated to be here to make sure your stuff works because if it doesn't work, we don't get that rebate, we don't get paid. And so that's why we're um, we set up our program to make sure we're motivated to make sure that every project we do is successful by being on your team. Because if we didn't set it up that way, I think it would In the early generations of solar collectors, there were large battery arrays involved. Is there any particular that would have you know a large bank with your land? No batteries in any of the buildings in this system? No. Going all the way from, okay. No, these are just, see, what we're putting on solar arrays are relatively small. This is about 4,000 square feet on each roof, so they're not particularly large. Mm -hmm. And they won't offset enough energy to need to store or send it back, <coughs> so to speak. So right. it'll, it'll all be used on site. Um, so you don't need battery backup systems with these. They're kind of um, leading edge technology, which um, we're not really in the business of providing stuff that's new anymore. Right. We want to make sure that we're using the best parts that are proven that you know will work. Um, so battery technology is something that we're we're using with these systems. So will have you found that there is typically in like a school setting energy that's sent back to the grid or no? Not? Is, okay. Because it's, it's, you're you're talking about like you know two or three hundred dollars of electricity per month. Yeah. And you should see your electric bills down. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so we're no, offsetting a small fraction. What what I did is I, I, I don't know if you have it or not, but I gave Dan a, a picture of each school, the energy consumption on a graph of what they historically have done, the expected energy production from the solar array, how that superimposes on your existing energy consumption and shows how your new energy consumption should look something like this subject to the sun doing what it's supposed to do. So what you'll find out is that we're never producing any more energy that you can use on the school at any moment in time. Okay. Therefore, it doesn't go back to the grid and no battery backups and all that stuff. Yep. Mr. Chapman? So if you're not <clears throat> if you're not using batteries then, um, for storage like when the sun's out today or whatever, how efficient are these panels with regard to cloudy weather? I mean here in Minnesota we've got as you have yep. seen a lot of cloudy days. Yeah. Um, so how when it's real cloudy, how much uh, energy are you, you get less energy, energy when it's cloudy. So right. so what, what happens is when you want to figure out how much energy is gonna come out from a solar array. Right? Um, what you use is something called 10-year TMY data. So like at the airport, they have these things that say this is much radiance that came down on this spot. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so that tells you how much energy is supposed to come on the panels in that 10-year period. And so you use that data and you use some programs that kind of model solar and it gives you the outcome of this is how much energy we expect you know, per DC unit of the solar panel. So what happens is there's about 1175 kilowatt hours that come out from every DC, you know, watts. You have a 40 kilowatt system, 40 times 1175 is about 48,000 kilowatt hours per year that each one of these would generate. And if you were down south, you get more. If you're up in Canada, you're going to get less. So it's based upon this location on Earth and the weather and the day that it actually lands here. So my question is, so I was reading here, and like you said, you still get energy on cloudy days. What about when our roof is covered in snow from days of nonstop heavy snowfall? Are we, or Christmas break, say when the schools are closed, are, how are we getting energy if it's, closed, if it's covered in snow for weeks? 
that's why the energy curve that you produce over the winter months is very, very low, and over the summer it's very high, and then the winter goes very low, so it kind of like looks like that. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we use those things called optimizers is because if I have a little bit of snow that covers one of my panels, if I don't have them, I don't get any energy out at all. Mm -hmm. So like I show you like on my phone, we have one of the things that comes with this is software that um, Joe and Dave and a couple of people that have to do that. Um, but the software that comes with the, the it matches up with the inverter technology we use. Um, they're the largest inverter company in the world. They're called Solar Edge. And um, that takes all the individual panels and it puts all the information on the web. Those little optimizers and that, putting them in parallel means if I cover part of the panel with snow and the rest of the solar area is covered, but the rest of the solar area will still produce energy. So when you're completely dumped, you get nothing. When the wind starts blowing and you start having a corner of the solar array exposed and it starts coming back. So you'll see a few days over the course of the year where there's just no energy there. That's why we use 10 year weather data because that statistically is what will be yielded over a period of time. Okay. Here's a picture of uh, Columbia Heights today. You can see, uh, barely see, but this is basically a, a bell curve and that's the energy produced. The area in the green is the KWH that was produced today. You can spin back and see uh, um, like yesterday, this is a little more choppier. It's uh, that's a cloudy day happening there. We have a nice sunny day, it's going to be a bell curve. But we track this daily, monthly, annually, whatever you like to show yeah. production. And the other thing about this is that every single solar panel that's up on your roof, this actually gives you individual readings of each solar panel. So, like, here's the layout here. And if there's a panel that's uh, producing differently, it's going to show up uh, as a different shade of blue. And if there's a problem panel, you'd see uh, you'd see this in red, and it would email our operations team, and you know there's a problem, and you come out and fix it. Mm -hmm. So it's a really useful tool. Mr. Chapman, well, I actually want to um, sorry, Dr. Yes, I'm kind of a fan of off the grid building, so I'm always thinking that there's a a battery. We're going to be connected to the regular grid, mm -hmm. and we will supplement some of our use with whatever we generate. Um, what happens when the regular grid is down? Are we dependent upon the connection to the regular grid? I'm wondering if the electricity was out in all the way near Lake. Are we out too? The solar array will turn off. And their solar arrays are designed to do that because if the grid is down or people are working on the grid, solar arrays will send energy back and shock people. So the inverters are built specifically that if they don't see power from the grid, they will not operate. Okay, so there's no benefit no. To, to be. You can't survive on this like that, but you can. Unless you've got batteries. If you put a, if you different kinds of systems, you can do that. You need battery backups and all sorts of stuff that's you know, not really germane to this. Okay, but, so yeah. you can't go, ha ha. I said it No, no, ha ha. Okay. Right. Okay. Mr. Chairman. So getting back to the battery question, <laughs> so batteries, um, I, I thought I heard that you know, battery technology had come to a point where you know, the costs had come down and so forth. Um, so basically what you're saying is it wouldn't be worthwhile then to, to have batteries for those days when the sun is really no. producing See, and- There's a few reasons. One is that the cost of the batteries <coughs> quite expensive yeah. relative to their benefit. The rate structure here in Minnesota doesn't provide any value to you to have battery backup It's flat. If you're in California where you have all these different things that are set up to work with solar, there's some value to having a battery here. I'll also tell you that when you're dealing with technology, the first few generations of technology that come out, you want to run as far away from as you can as solar. I'll tell you that, I know that, because we're putting in more of the first generation of solar in the state than any other company. All our systems work, but it was hard work getting them work right. Um, so I don't want to leave with equipment that's novel. Um, and there's other issues with lithium ion. Um, that's basically something that can oxidize and burn your building now. So I'm not a big fan of putting like lithium batteries in bulk inside of establishments with kids. That's, I won't go there. And so there's different kinds of technology <coughs> coming out in the battery backup stuff. It has to use like things like electrolytes and things like that. The coolest one I've ever seen. It's basically the same size as the solar array. It costs the same amount as the solar array. It's a massive steel container that has electrolytes in it. This is the last 25 years. It's the same stuff that they, um, the orange stuff that they
they pour out of like helicopters to put fires out in the forest. You can make solar batteries out of it. It won't hurt anybody, but it costs an enormous amount of money, and it's all novel game stuff. So we don't know whether it's beta, VHS, CD. We don't have any idea what batteries are yet. When we know what they are, we'll be there. But until we know what they are and they figure it out, I want to make sure we deliver stuff that's going to work long term, always with people. And you can add them on at a future date, not yep. a problem. Yep, so that's true. The technology is designed to work with. with some you be yeah, you would add battery and controls and all sorts of stuff and some more wiring and things. But um, that would only be beneficial if you wanted to capture energy and use it at night or, you know, you had excess and you wanted to save it, you know, and that's not, not what we're talking about here. Okay. Mr. Wilson. The converse of our student liaison, Madison's question, we're going to produce our peak electrical production at the time when our building occupancy is at its lowest. How's that power handled then? Oh, help me understand. Well, we're going, to, we're going to generate the most electricity during the summer hours, or summer months, right? Well, that's when the buildings are at their lowest occupancy. That's also when you're charged the most for your electricity, except yep. for one building. Um, it's also when you have these peak plans for the utility, you have these, what's that called, peak control? control. Yeah, so peak control. So basically, every single unit that you run over a threshold amount, you get penalized by the utility, like, tremendously. And that happens during the summer when it's hot, when air conditioning happens. And guess what? That's when solar does its best. So every unit of energy, this is a 40 kilowatt solar array, it will produce 36 kilowatts at peak power during the summer. It will be exceeding the draw on the solar panels, even when our buildings are done. Um, yeah, that's, that's the size of it. But they're especially beneficial in the summer during the conditions that you're talking about because that's when you get the benefits. You're saving on kilowatt hours. You're saving on kill, you know, demand. And nothing would go back to the grid even then, huh? No, they're, they're all sized such that they're, none of them are any larger than your consumption. And that's one of the things that Dan had us do is match up the actual consumption for each building to what the actual production of the solar is to make sure that we didn't have anything that really sent anything back. With the exception of one building, I don't remember which one it was, called Golf View, where you don't have any occupancy during the summer, we're still in a spot where we're not producing more energy than that building consumes cycle. So, so even if you did um, buy law order in that metering state, they'd have to buy back the excess yes, energy. Exactly. Yep. They buy it back at a wholesale rate uh, of about three and a half cents instead of the 12 cents that you're, uh, you're getting charged. So we want to make sure we size them properly so that doesn't happen, and that's the case for your building. So putting too much solar on a building is never good because you don't get anything from the utility for it. You just want to use it all on site and avoid the electric cost that they want to charge you, but you don't want to send it back to them so they pay you nothing for it. Yeah. Ms. Bain? I just have a thank you. I, I think it's about time we moved into alternative energies. Um, and then the question you mentioned all buildings. Is this going on all buildings in the district? Yeah, or are there it's all on all buildings right away. As you know, we've got a bunch of old books, yeah. and it doesn't make sense to mm -hmm. spend the money putting on those right now and then have to take them off in the next couple of years to put the new roof on. So we've identified five buildings okay. that it would work for right now. We've had new roofs. We won't be touching them in the next 20 years. And now we're going to do a bunch more roofs. We're going to do six more roof sections this summer. <coughs> so we look at adding solar to them six roofs through after, after the roofing is done. So maybe in the okay. fall or next summer. Because that was the basis of my question. Yep. When we look at our facilities, we know we're going to be replacing roofs. Yep. And we're in the middle of a facilities planning also. Yep. So there's certain buildings that have been identified. Yeah, we're right down, right down. And we're not going to touch any other ones mm -hmm. that are kind of a mix of facility plans that we'll get that all day. Oh, okay. Yep. We mapped out the roofs and mm -hmm. the panels will only go on roofs that are new. Yep. So some portions of we have multiple buildings where just a portion of the roof is new. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a portion that works for a good the location for the panels, then we'll, we'll do that. Yeah. What we don't want to have to do is pull yeah. these panels off okay. in seven or eight years because we need to repair yeah. them. Yeah. That's okay. part of our process when we go through mm -hmm. figuring out what's going on. One of the things we need to do is make sure we're putting it on the right roof, make sure we have a roof warranty that we do all the stuff that's necessary to preserve it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are things you have to do to do it right. You know, we engage our structural engineers to make sure they're in the right spots mm -hmm. and that we have the right amount of ballast. And this, you know, with school code, your code is much more restrictive than general mm -hmm. buildings. So we have to make sure that everything we do is consistent with all that. And so one of the biggest things is making sure when you put something on a roof, you want to pair it up with a new roof, you don't want to put it on an old roof. Yeah. And so that's what, one of the things that we've been working on as a team, all four of us, is to pick those roofs, pick the new ones, find the opportunities, 
match up with what we can do now, match up with new groups that are coming, um, looking at your you know, comprehensive plan, finding places that we might have some opportunities that things work out right or not. And so um, that's what we've kind of worked out as a, as a group to try to find those, those right spots and then kind of incrementally um, uh, work through them as they become right. Okay. And thank you for including the education piece too. Yeah. I was that jumped out at me as I was reading through that we will help schools incorporate the data into yeah. the, the science standards. We're, we're trying really hard to, um, I, one of the people on my team is a, a gal who is an educator, and her name is Marcy McGuire. Um, and she works in basically building curriculums for schools, that's mm -hmm. kind of her thing. And so she works with us to help build curriculums. And what, what our goal is kind of been, it's like anybody will throw a brochure and say for solar. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of interested in really doing it right. So we're mindful of the standards and what they're coming, and we build programs that are aligned with the new standards. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to have something that actually can be used in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And what we really found is the biggest resistance from that as teachers, um, to be honest with you. Um, maybe it, because it's hard to integrate something that works in a system that they're used to, or things like that. So we work really hard to kind of overcome those barriers and make sure that we're delivering something that meets standards that mm -hmm. can be used inside of the curriculum legitimately. Mm -hmm. And we targeted um, two different places. We targeted um, in that, I'm speaking out of my, mm -hmm. uh, I'm speaking partially with partial knowledge, so I, mm -hmm. bear with me as I say that. But what we've done is kind of targeted the, um, the education in the fifth, fourth, fifth grade area where they have an, a science component. We built a curriculum around the standards around that with some examples of learning and all those different mm -hmm. things that kids go through with, you know, getting together in groups and you know, all the, the steps that are integral to that process. Mm -hmm. And then um, we found that the place where we have a lot of landing without having to get deep into the curriculum part of it is uh, kind of the physics classes. In the higher end classes, what we turn over is a lot of material. We turn over education, over structural drawings, electrical drawings, parts, manuals, the ability to monitor stuff on the web, track it. And there's so many things you can do with the science curriculum just by having something to talk about without even having a formative curriculum about it. And we found that a lot of physics teachers kind of reach out to us and say, hey, I want to sit down and see what we can use this for. Mm -hmm. And they use that well in the classroom. But it's hard to break into the traditional process of, mm -hmm. you know, I have, a, I have a standard I need to teach you, but I have to teach this part of it. And the teachers kind of use what they, they know. Mm -hmm. And we want to get something that's really easy so that they can say, I'd like to use this. And that's what our, our plan is and our goal. But in terms of tracking long-term data, you know, the math classes were often asking science. We would give them data that they would use with the kids for graphing and stuff. So you have a wealth of data. Grab it all. Yeah, it can be real. Grab it all real time. Yeah, they can look at it in the classroom. Look at data. clouds go yeah. over and see what happens mm -hmm. to that. There's, there's a lot of fun things. There's you know. a lot of application. Oh, yeah. You bet. Structural engineering, electrical mm -hmm. engineering. Um, we like to have um, some of our professionals kind of come in and visit the kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our structural engineers are like, yeah, let me come in, I'd love to do that. And, you know, we have mm -hmm. an education component where one of uh, the gentlemen who works with us also has an educational part of his curriculum that he, that he provides for us as one of our master electricians. So we have him come in and visit mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Uh, she has part of my question and a question of the buildings. Um, kind of tied into that, so what percentage of our um, usage would come from solar as opposed to the standard that we have now and what are we building towards? What, what standards are you? Well, if we're using we're using electricity now that's coming from. And off the grid, right? What? Off the grid. Right. What we're buying right now. So She's asking how much solar would we use? What, yeah, what, what amount does the solar produce and what are we looking at trying to increase that to? How much will we use our demand on the grid? Right. Very small. It, it's each each system is about it depends on the school because they have a lot of different consumption profiles at the school. But each solar will also have about five thousand dollars worth of cost of energy to give you an idea. So um, that's just kind of from the basic amount of energy that's produced and approximately what energy costs. Okay, so that's the amount. So if you spend a hundred thousand dollars a year, you can offset about one twentieth of your consumption. We spend about a little over a million a year on electricity. Yeah, I'm showing eighty-six thousand dollars for uh, December of eighteen. Yeah. For that really? previous month was eighty-six thousand dollars. So if we're talking about six thirty thousand dollars would be generated annually, not monthly. So then, what are we trying to build to? Because that's almost like a drop in the bucket overall. If we're talking millions of dollars, I mean, are we looking to, to build this to a certain point? 
or? Well, I think ultimately we'd like to see panels on all of our sites. Um, beyond that, I think what the challenge, the challenge with schools doing solar, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the right. challenge with schools doing solar is the capital investment on the front end is so significant. And so the tax, the rebate and the, and the tax incentives allow somebody to capitalize on an incentive that we couldn't capitalize on because we can't capitalize on a tax incentive to so pay taxes. So it allows someone to capitalize on that and then um, that reduces our capital expenditure. So this project is gonna cost us nothing. They're gonna make some money on it in the process. We're gonna get a $137,500 solar panel on our roof, reducing our carbon footprint, savings about $1,000 a year per unit for the first 13 years. And then we'll see significant savings, um, you know, in the, $10,000 um, uh, annually on each unit after that. So once the 13 <coughs> years is kind of like a mortgage, you're paying off the, the um, capital investment. So it, it's kind of a nice arrangement for us because we don't have to come up with money to do this. So if if there's a, another strategy that, there are. that comes up where we can expand the square footage, I think that'd be something for us to continue to explore, and this is probably a pretty good first step. Wait, I'll tell you what your limit is. Well, this is this is the solar rewards program, and this is limited to 40 kilowatts AC. That's one opportunity. And then um, what you'll find, and there are other ways of doing solar. They have other programs that are available um, that allow you to do larger solar projects. You can go up to a megawatt, which is you know 20 times bigger. What you'll find is is that you don't have the roof that's new to do it. We had to struggle to find roof available that was new to accommodate the spaces that. So you have this incremental plan to add all these little sections of roof up. What you want to do if you want to do larger solar is you want to replace a lot of roof and you want to put solar on it at the same time. Because <coughs> the amount of money you can save by doing this, I'm being straight with you, when you put a big solar array on an actual big roof at the same time it's installed, you're going to pay for your roof for free. It's the way it works out. I love it. Okay. But you're limited right now because you have all these different sections of roof. They're small, they're compartmentalized. You don't have like a big open, there are very few schools that you actually have like a big open flat roof. It's all sorts of little compartmentalized roofs and they have different ages that are all kind of incrementally through there. So where we see new roofs, we're, we'd love to get, work with you in different ways to do more. <coughs> but we're just kind of dealing with what we can do now based upon the circumstances we have. So say we're a district that's looking at building <laughs> Are we considering this in the facilities planning at all? If we actually build a high school or build a middle school or build a, I mean, is that something that we're looking at? Yeah, maybe doing the whole entire thing on one of those buildings? Yeah, or? we're a long ways from that, but I think if we're building a new school, that we'd be looking at that. There's something to look at. What you do is when you build your school, you just make sure that it's built so that you meet the structural standards to allow you to put the solar array on top of it. That's the thing that you need to do. And if you can fit it on from a structural perspective, then you can put as much solar on it that will fit subject to setbacks and lanes and all the different electrical code and building code requirements and stuff like that. I have, I have several questions. Cool. Um, so I thought in the initial conversation you said it was gonna cost the district 15% to we had to pay a portion of the installation for the panels. Is um, that not the case? No. Um, there's no cost in the district? No. There's, so we don't charge anything for this system. The only payments you make to us. What happens is after we turn on the solar array, after it's made one month of energy, we collect a payment for that month's energy. From the, not from the district, but from, from, the district. The, from the district. Because you guys saved on your electric bill because you didn't have to buy that energy. So what we're doing is we're swapping an expense from a utility, from an expense for an asset that you own on your roof instead. So it's just a swapping of an expense, and the expense for the solar energy is a little less than you're paying for the grid. We have this 25-year system asset that lasts that long, and it'll last longer. And we've set it up to have a payback period of 13 years. And so once 13 happens, all that energy that's generated for 13 to infinity and beyond comes to the school district completely free. And so that's that's where you get okay. that part. Okay, I, I understand. So. Okay. What you're saying is that, so we're, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, you said we're currently we're looking at five locations for panels? Probably up to five. Up so. to five. 
and those would each cost a thousand dollars so we're looking at basically we would be paying back your company five thousand dollars that's what you're saving so that's what well you, you just told me you just said that it's going to cost us you're paying we're paying you back the difference for that Let me help so um we're saving energy we're saving about five thousand okay. dollars a year in energy the amount we collect is about four thousand dollars for that same energy therefore you know we collect that four thousand dollars a little bit per month over the course of the year for 13 years okay and that extra money is money you save as you go so so we would pay the five thousand to excel yeah you're built from Excel. Instead, we are built from Excel, which reduced five thousand. I understand. Yep. Okay. And that would that five thousand would go to your company then? Yeah, that's how we we pay for the, okay. the solar array. We that, so four, basically, yeah, 5, 000, four thousand goes. Four thousand goes to yeah, the, the district company. Keeps a thousand. The, kid, yeah. the district keeps a thousand. Yeah. yeah. So, you'd be so per 5, month, we're we're basically we're obligated to you if it's a if the the number is a thousand, right? We're obligated to you for four thousand a month to help pay back these units as they get placed on the roofs. Um, yeah, you're you're saving money. I, I understand. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's correct. So we we get paid by we monetize a tax credit for you. Plus, you get the tax credit. We, we monetize it, which means we work it through the bank, and the bank takes a, a large fraction of it, and then it comes back to our company to help pay for the solar. Right? That's one chunk. We wait ten years from the utility to get paid another chunk. And then we collect money from the school, which is power payments over 13 years that are as I described. So those are payments now that, you know, you're not paying the utility because those kilowatts and those kilowatt hours that you're pulling from the grid, guess what? You're not buying them anymore because they're coming from your roof. So that unit cost on the utility bill, your units will go down that you get billed for by the utility and those are produced from the building. Because when you have a solar and electrons are lazy, they come from the closest spot. So if you have a solar in your building, they're going to come from the solar array first, and then they're going to pull from the grid. So it's always pulling from the building, and that's where the savings comes from. So if I were if I were a private company and yep. I came to you and said, hey, I want to put this solar array on the top of my building, yep. and, and just tell me what it costs, what would, what would the cost be for that solar it's array? Same price that you guys are paying, and they would pay $137,000 in the So it's $137,000 is the what present. the cost is. Right. And then what's going on with us is per unit. Per unit. Okay. And, and what we do is we take that rebate and all those different things, and I think what we collect is about $70,000 incrementally over 13 years to help pay for that $137,000 asset is what's going on. So it's like you're paying like on 45% mm -hmm. of the actual cost as a school just from expense savings instead of having to buy it or put money in or levy or any of those types of things. So what happens um, so what happens if we have to replace a roof um, and the solar panel is there and you have to come out and remove it? Do we have to pay an additional cost for that? Yep. That's why we pick new roofs. Okay, yep. well I mean listen, you know, we get fifteen feet of snow, which never happens in Minnesota, but if, it, if we do, if a roof collapse, then there's a problem. And I understand there's insurance and a lot of things, but still, that's a bottom line cost for us. We come so, back and we rebuild it with the insurance. So you stuff. would have to come back, rebuild it, yep. and there would be an additional cost for... That would be part of your insurance. But I understand. Yes, that would be part of something. Like if you had an air conditioner unit and it was damaged in the same circumstances, <clears throat> it would be the same thing. So the Either insurance rate on no. that for a million dollars worth of solar panels is $138 a year. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty yeah. affordable. Is that a year? A year. A year. Yeah. So there's really no cost for the insurance part of it. It's pretty negligible. And it's there for that kind of odd, obscure thing that you never expect to happen. But if it does, we plan for that. And we've got it covered and we've accounted for the cost of that and what we've looked at as well. Mr. Chapman. In terms of the insurance, um, would the insurance company, a property property insurance company, increase the deductible uh, on those panels should they be damaged compared to you know the rest of the buildings, the rest of the structures, uh, given the fact that they are so vulnerable to hail and, and so forth? Well, we know that? the first thing is they're really not vulnerable to hail and stuff like that. They're engineered around that, so that doesn't become an issue. So um, they would take, uh, it, it, because we've had yep. great ball sides hail, huh? Too yep. far from here. Would they withstand a, a baseball or grapefruit? Size? No, they're engineered for 50, about 50 mile an hour winds and like an inch of hail. 
But if you have something it's bigger, bigger inch diameter, yeah. Right. yeah. So, golf so it's it's tempered glass, heavy duty aluminum. They're pretty durable panels. We've only had uh, I think three panels out of our what 20,000 damaged by hail. Because you never get them directly <coughs> north going storm. It comes from the side. They're at an angle. Yeah. And they're at an angle. I'll pitch a 10 degree pitch. And so like the, the way that the insurance industry views solar is um, they, they now rate solar. They were kind of an evolving industry, but now they consider solar to, we're actually rated as a, an HVAC company, is how the insurance companies have responded. So they basically look at solar now like a rooftop unit. And when we're doing a business, we're basically, you know, work comp, but everything is aligned with that exact profession. The way they treat solar assets is like a, a air conditioner unit or HVAC system or a chiller on your roof. It's just equipment on your roof. And um, it's, it's treated exactly the same. There's so no the insurers aren't necessarily bumping up deductibles nope. specific to those units? They charge you premiums for it. And then it's just another air conditioner unit to an insurance company at this point in time. And that's an honest rate for common brand. Mr. Wilson, on the weather vane, no pun intended, um, lightning strikes, are they grounded? Um, so there's no likely possibility of a surge that would <coughs> damage equipment down the line? Nope. There's all sorts of equipment and electrical code requirements that we have to do to deal with all those things. Yep. Other questions, comments? You know, I, I just say for me, and I'm, I'm just going to be, because I'm pretty candid, you guys know that, uh, I'm trying to figure out, I, I'm, I'm all for looking at the solar technology and seeing how it will benefit the district and thinking along those lines. I think that's a great value um, to the district. But my concern is, is that why now? Why are we doing it now when we have a whole facility plan that's going to get ready to come into play and how come we're not looking at it as a broader scope when maybe some of these buildings are changing and it seems to me that if if we install a rooftop unit over the summer months or over the spring and then all of a sudden something changes from the plan that we're still working through and trying to figure out what that looks like um, you know something the buildings might change Right, so we're we're ready to jump on this thing now. From what you guys are saying, and and it could be that our some of our buildings might change. And how is that benefiting us if we've got to then, um, excuse me, you know, pay again to come back out and remove the unit and install it someplace else or or do something else? I mean, and what buildings are identified? Uh, we've been really careful to stay out of the the buildings that have been talked about in the facilities by Mr. Wald and I have attended all the meetings and the buildings we're talking about right now are uh, Onega, Birch Lake, which just got a new roof two years ago, Lake Ayers, which also just got a new roof two years ago, and uh, a section of Matoska, who just got the new gym, and they would go on a new gym that was built four years ago. So we've been uh, very careful to- Onega, uh, Birch, Matoska, Lake Ayers. Lake Ayers, thank Ayers. you. Is there one more? That's four. Uh, that was four, and then uh, after we do the new roofs this summer, uh, there's been talk about Badness Heights, uh, Willow, possibly Sunrise in Normandy, but uh, they've been talking about it in the facilities plan too, so we're going to hold off on them until, until after that gets presented to the board. And so we're moving slowly. We don't want to. I'm just like you, Mr. Mullen, I don't want to, we're going to save a little bit of money, we're not going to save a ton of money, and I don't want to be spending money to move panels. And we're going to be very careful about that. And I, I think the, the reason we want to jump on it now is just because uh, the rebate incentives have been cut and we lock into the higher rate right now and we'll pass up that 25%. Excel Energy is not up. making it any easier to do solar. Let's be direct with it. I mean, they don't want it. I think it's something that kind of um, makes it harder for them to be in business. And they're required to do this by the legislature, by the PUC, <coughs> by people that want it. And so, um, you know, tax credits, tax rates are going down next year. The tax credit goes down and it starts spiraling down after that. So our ability to monetize that disappears. That means you get to pay more. Um, the rebates from last year are now down less. So if you want to go there, if you want to do a solar rate now, then you have to pay more because it costs a certain amount to do a project. So these different little buckets that kind of add up to make 
you guys only have to pay a certain amount, which is relatively small compared to what's going on, which is paid for just from energy savings. Is it expense savings? Um, it's kind of like the perfect storm. When you're doing solar, you want to capitalize on all the opportunities as they come. And we work really hard to align them so that they work right for people at the right times. So um, we're mindful of the things you're talking about about going forward. Um, we'd love to talk to you about future projects. But in the here and now, this is really a wonderful way to um, do some things that I, I think that I've heard that people are generally supportive to save some money to get some education in the schools and, and, um, and accomplish some of those things. And again, I'm not, not supportive of solar. I'm just saying that I, it just seems to me, and I respect what you're saying, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a little leery of wondering why it's, you know, we're right in the middle of a facilities plan. We don't really know what everything's going to look like, right? I think that for me, I, I want to understand a little bit of the value back to the school district of understanding, you know, if we're paying X amount um, and then there's some tax incentives, I, I want to understand that a little bit more. I wish that information would have came forward a little bit beforehand so that we can look at it. Spain? I have a, I see it as a good time to do it because we are in the middle of a facilities plan. And I tread, there's been a, a lot going on with the facilities plan. We haven't, we've got a partial report. Um, we haven't got the final report. But my thinking is, as I said before, it's about time we started looking at alternative forms of energy. And because we are in the middle of a facilities plan, I'm assuming that a lot of work has been done on identifying buildings, et cetera, that this would be the time to take advantage of this and move into something like this. That would, you know, I need to see the final facilities report, but I would say we're coming to the end of that facilities planning and it would be the time to look at certain buildings and, and move on something like this. That would be my personal feeling. Dr. Master. I think I'm with Ms. Fahey on this also because it sounds like you all have looked at the questions we're thinking of and we're all thinking about change. But this is a great opportunity to not spend up front to a great time payment for all. So pay it down at a at zero percent. And um, teach kids to reduce their carbon footprint. I mean, I just think it's a great teaching tool that we're not paying a humongous amount for, like we usually do. And as long as I know it's expandable, whether you can add batteries later if they turn out to be more reasonable, or make the arrays larger when it looks like that's the way to go, it seems like beginning set of a rector, the, the beginning rector set, kind of, and a good time to start. Mr. Chapman? What is the window of opportunity, so to speak, as far as, you know, how quickly do we need to act on this to get these uh, incentives, or uh, the rebates and so forth, and, you know, last year's and so forth, uh, what you so they have a, a sunset on them with respect to timing, and so um, as long as we get them built by you know October, November, we're fine. And so we've kind of worked on a plan that is you know incrementally works through that, um, but that's the timing to ultimately execute. But okay, so if you have them built by October, so when would you need to start by? I guess and kind of work your backward as far as the yep. decision making process. We've done, we've done a lot of the work already up front, to be honest with you. A lot of the work of the logistics to figure out when, where, and how. So it's a matter of deploying our structural engineers to get them out to do that, and getting a final electrical design done with our electrical engineers, getting those through the utility. That takes usually about a month, month and a half. If things don't work out structurally, that's our expense. It's not your issue, it's ours, so we don't ever go there. Um, but so there's about a, a two, or two or three month window to plan, and then there's about a, a three to get the engineering and everything teed up, and then if you deploy your construction, it takes about a month to get everything done from beginning to end. From Permits being pulled, the clothes started up, the cell turning it on, so to speak. So we need to have a decision by April of May at the latest. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Just like one final question. Yes. Um, so these are just, we're not able to do all the panels on all of our buildings because of the new plan. 
what is the cost look like for future then? Because we're not going to be able to get them all built, but if we plan on doing this to future buildings, the cost is going to change, correct? It's going to go up because the prices, like the rebates and stuff, won't be as low as yes. are right now. What is the do you have any idea of projected cost for the future? Yeah, you'd be, it, really it basically takes your opportunity and it takes it and extends the time um, window. So you'll add anywhere from three to seven years on it, and then you're just basically having something on your roof that you get incremental savings on. So we kind of built it to, you know, have a incremental savings and a large payback when it's done. So, yeah, but that kind of takes it and it makes it all incremental if you if you wait and tax credits go down and all these things disappear. It is, it, the cost of building um, stuff is normalized. The prices of all the products have kind of um, plateaued to the point where businesses were put out because it got so competitive. So now when that naturally happens, then prices kind of normalize, and that's kind of where we're at right now, and then things don't get any cheaper as you, they go on with respect to this. They're just going to keep on going up and up and up. So, yeah. Other questions, comments, concerns? Mr. Wilson. This is really is for Dan. Um, I think, Don, you've got a pretty valid point that we're in the mid-cycle of this uh, uh, building plan. Um, why solar? Why now? Did we look at any other alternative? You know, hydro be out. But we've, been, we've been looking at solar mm -hmm. like four or five years since both Wayne and I got here. We've been pitched by community gardens, large arrays on our roofs, and all of them require you to lock in for 25, 30 years. And really hesitant to, to throw our head in there with technology changing and battery power and this was the one thing that came to us that wasn't a huge commitment for us, wasn't a big sum of money we had to pay up front to jump in and it just, it just seemed it's not going to save us a ton of money up front electrically but it, the biggest thing it's not going to cost us anything. And it's, uh, it's a good way to start. Uh, all the pitches I've had, they've promised you the world and this is such a small array I'd love to see, I'd love to see us start small show us that this is going to work show us show us that's going to save us money and then we can start looking at expanding if it does so it doesn't really throw us all in at one time you're going to know everything you want to know about solar by doing this when you're done and you'll be able to make all sorts of smart decisions about what you want but if you don't ever get there you'll really you're kind of in this spot where you don't know how it works for you I would just like to see a chart or a graph of some kind showing the numbers. It's hard for me to visualize. And so if I could get access to those, that would really help. Send me an Okay. Yeah, we, we, we've done, we, these guys have all that stuff. Um, and do you want to circulate or how, how would you like to board it to people or what would you like to do? Uh, maybe I'm going to share with Dr. Kazmierczak and we can give them to you. That'd be okay. great. Thank yeah, you. Glad, glad to do that. That's definitely part of what we deliver. We have a detailed cash flow summary that has all the numbers in there. So yep. be good for you to digest. Are there questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Everybody. Really appreciate it very much. Next is uh, the update on the fiscal year 2020 budget development. Do we want to do that? Yes, sir. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. In January, Tom Mazork and I brought to the board uh, mid-year budget adjustments, and those were approved in February. And we also uh, looked at a very preliminary budget for 2019-20. Um, that's our fiscal year 20 budget that we'll be bringing to the board in May and for board approval in June. And we refer to that as our preliminary FY20 budget. Uh, this this uh, slide shows our our budget process. So if you look from the beginning of our fiscal year, and, and this is a new slide you haven't seen before, but it really summarizes uh, the process that we've used for years. And so I'll be using this every time we, we reach a milestone on the, um, on the slide, I'll be bringing this slide back so you understand the process that the budget, the budget takes. So beginning with our fiscal year, which is July 1st, uh, July and October, 
um, is when the official auditor for the district, our certified public accountants, MMKR, begin their work and they look at closing the books for, um, for the previous year and auditing your books. That occurs um, July, August into October. That keeps our finance department busy providing reports for the auditors as they come in. So that's the, the first step. In September, um, the uh, uh, Minnesota Department of Education publishes or prepares for us the initial levy certification. And we spend, uh, that's about the end of September, and we share that with the board. We will spend September, October, into November communicating with MDE as they make up uh, recalculations to the levy certification. That's uh, about 4,000 calculations that go into that. And MDE does that for us. And it considers, um, what's a little awkward about it is our fiscal year and the county fiscal years don't line up. We're on a July through June, they're on a January through December fiscal year. So, uh, they, so that process begins in September and goes through December. Um, in November or more likely December, we bring the audit to the board and Jim Eichton, the managing, um, managing partner with MMKR, will bring the audit to the board. We did that this past December. Um, also in December, we hold our truth and taxation hearing. The truth and taxation hearing is a legal requirement. It has to be completed uh, by mid-December. So we pair that up with our December regular board meeting and we had that just this past December. The next step is in January, February, we, we bring uh, mid-year adjustments to the board, usually to a January work session for board approval in February. Um, and then in June, uh, May, usually a May work session, we bring a preliminary budget to the board and then in June, the, the board would approve the uh, preliminary budget for the following school. So we're kind of like right in between that January, February, and June time where there's not a milestone on the budget. So we're just bringing an update uh, to you today. Um, in January and February, we shared that we'd be making cuts uh, to our expenditures, trying to keep those in line for the 20 fiscal year 2019-20. Uh, at that time, our initial targeted target was a number of 1.75 million. On further study, we're thinking we should target closer to 2.5 million. That uh, we think those uh, would be more responsible numbers for us to look at. Matt will talk about those that process in a moment. Um, costs related to transportation, special education, payroll um, impact those numbers. And so, while the inflationary rate in education is typically in the two to five percent, depending on what category you're looking at. Um, the funding from the state does, has not kept pace with that. So we know, we've talked about the special ed cross subsidy, that our special ed revenue is capped. Special ed tends to have the highest um, uh, inflationary increase from year to year in the neighborhood of about 5%. And so year after year, that's been a draw on our general fund to the tune of almost $11 million um, that's being subsidized. Those are expenditures that are important for us to make. We're serving our most vulnerable students through our special education program. They're the right expenses to make. We're gonna to continue to make those expenses. It's the right thing to do. Um, revenues from the state have not kept pace in the special ed world. Additionally, the um, state has committed to about 2% each year for the last five years, and those were increases over the five years before that. About 2% to the general ed formula. It's important to understand that when the state um, says they're gonna increase the formula by 2%, that doesn't impact our entire budget. It impacts about 60% of our budget. Just under $70 million is impacted by that 2% increase. So uh, I think what happens is the state makes that announcement and people think schools were really taken care of this year. They were really taken care of. And, and we have felt better about 2% increases because before that it was one and a half, one, one, and then in uh, 2010, 2011, the it was a 0% increase to the farm run. So um, that's just a little bit of history on that and, and, and how um, you know revenues and education, even though the last few biennials they've tried to take care of education, it just hasn't been enough. Um, so 
That's a, we think that 2.5 million is probably the right number for us to target, so that's what we're working on. Um, and we'll be coming to the board in April with recommendations for those adjustments. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, and we will do questions at the end, and Matt will kind of talk about process and where we're at. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to spell out the timeline a little bit, and then to also be clear around kind of what we are and aren't pursuing when we're thinking about those adjustments. And so, uh, to be very clear, what we aren't pursuing when we're looking at the $2.5 million there is we're really not looking at classroom staffing as a means of resolving that budget. And so, when we're looking at our staffing ratios for 2019-20, we really took um, the world we're living in right now with our staffing ratios in 18-19, and we moved them forward adjusted for student population. So we would expect that we're really going to be running with the same level of staffing in 19-20 that we were experiencing this year. Um, so we're not looking to see a reduction across the board. Now there are some sites because there's just ebbs and flows with where our student population is and where some of our big classes are moving through our system. So, you know, it's kind of an anomaly. Next year at North, for instance, we're seeing a reduction um, of a little more than 50 students. Uh, that's what we're projecting there. So unless that really changes through, uh, through in-district enrollment or open enrollment, that's going to be the reality there. So that site will see a small shift, but their relative staffing level will remain the same. And that's gonna track at all of our sites there. So there may be a section up at an elementary or a section down at another. However, across the board, we're gonna be maintaining those staffing levels. Um, so I just wanted to be really clear about that. Some of the things that we are pursuing, and we will be bringing a recommendation forward um, to the work session in April. So on April 22nd, we'd be looking to bring a recommendation forward. Some of the things that we are looking at, um, we're going to be reviewing our hiring practices so that we make sure that we can uh, see some cost savings in that in that area as we're moving into to the next year. Um, in addition to that, we're, we've been working with the Teachers Association on uh, looking into uh, early retirement incentive or an early retirement program. And that does have the potential to save a significant amount of money over a one and even two year period um, as we would see some of our staffing costs significantly reduced there. And that's really what I'm talking about, just about being mindful as we're reviewing our hiring practices to make sure that we're still bringing really excellent uh, teachers and other staff members into the system, but also making sure that we're aware that we need to do that responsibly at the same time. Um, We've also had all of our program directors uh, really looking at what can they, what can we do um, around the edges there. I know that Lisa Orr, for instance, has been looking really seriously at where are those areas where we could maybe see some significant improvements on the special ed side. Just uh, taking an extra look at all of our programming um, to see if there's anything that we can do there. So I know that we'll be bringing back some recommendations in that area. Again, trying to keep that away from that direct service provision to students um, wherever possible. Uh, so that's really, those are really the key areas that we're looking at there. Um, and we're confident that we'll be able to, to hit that number. And we also know that uh, any time that, that we run into a situation like this, there may be opportunities that we'll need to look a year further down the line to really explore. Um, but we'll do what we uh, what we believe that we need to in this round to start 1920. Um, so just again, that timeline will be bringing recommendations forward to the board on uh, the April uh, work session, and then any re any adjustments that would require board action, we'd be looking for a vote on that in May in the business meeting. Sounds first. Are there any hopeful signs from the legislature and the governor that there's going to be any sort of adjustment to the special ed funding or any other types of education funding to help ease these issues? Well, there's a number of bills in front of the legislature right now where they're looking at special ed funding. Um, governor has, a, you know, is looking to increase the formula, and but we're we're early in the session to get a, a feeling for what's going to happen with that. I think the governor's proposal on special ed essentially keeps the cross subsidy from growing further. So, I mean, it would be 
helpful, but it wouldn't solve the long-term problem. And then uh, I don't know if this is a—I don't know if this should cause a sense of optimism, but um, I believe the, <clears throat> the the Senate has gone on record as saying uh, that a, a two percent and two percent would be uh, where they would expect to land. The governor has proposed three percent and two percent, um, and uh, what did the House propose today? Did the details come up today or later this week? So if um, you know if. If the Senate is saying that two and two is, is the floor as they see it, then perhaps maybe it will be a little higher than that. But uh, um, the difficulty is we're in a situation where um, there's a battle to get two and two on, a, on the formula. And as Tim indicated, our expenses are going up from three to five or even six percent. In fact, special ed is probably a tick about five percent annually. Um, so, so I don't know if there's a sense of optimism or not. I'm not optimistic about two and two. There are some folks who would say two and two means we're in a hold harmless situation in school districts, and this that, that's simply not true. Two and two is not hold harmless. Two and two will, is um, catching up to districts all throughout the state. So. And will there be enough time? Because I mean, the legislative session ends at the end of May, but we will likely be voting on the budget before that. Now in June. Be, or we, or we go down in, in June. June. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. And usually by the end of the session, we have a pretty good indication of where where it's going to land. Um, um, if they go into special session and we don't know and it's still up for debate, then we we have to present a budget in June for approval because we are required to by law. So we would make assumptions based on where we think it might be, and then we back it off a quarter of a percent or something like that just to cover us. But, we built in 1.5% on the formula for fiscal 20. Um, so hopefully we're a little higher than that. But So we've already built in, built in a little bit of a conservative uh, view of, the, of what the state will do. Thank you. And probably also just to add to that I think a lot of what we'll be bringing forward in terms of recommendations um, are things that we believe we probably should be looking at to some extent in any case too. And so I don't know that it would be terrifically impactful if there was uh, a small change there with legislative funding. Mr. Chairman? Matt, could you uh, expand on what you mean when you say uh, look at hiring practices? Uh, could you give a little more detail about that? Sure, absolutely. So for instance, um, you know, it can really, you know, I think to look at that responsibly, especially when times are a little bit tighter, but I really think in general that it can be important to take a little bit more of a market-based approach as we're looking at um, hiring talent in any area. Um, but when we're looking at hiring teachers, for instance, you know, there are a lot of areas where we need to aggressively pursue talent and make sure that we're that we're really active um, in that pursuit. So there's a lot of licensure areas where it's really tough to build a candidate pool that we're going to be excited about. At the same time, there's also a number of licensure areas where we will have um, 50 to 250 applicants for our for our individual roles, and so it's about taking a look at those respective pools and saying, you know, if we have a lot of talent in this pool, where are we going to responsibly hire there to make sure that you know that we can be offering the the number of sections we want to offer within our programming. Other display. So, what was the reason for going up to 2.5 million? What, what were we seeing in the numbers that caused the increase? So the increase, yeah, from 1.75 to 2.5 is really based on what um, we think is pretty some more accurate number. When the roll-up costs we originally used, we think, is probably too conservative. That 2% uh, increase in expenditures is probably tighter than we're going to be able to operate in. So right now we're behind, or we're, we're short 11, 11 million, right? In the cross subsidy. In the cross subsidy. Yes. So are we looking at this trying to get back to even, or what kind of time frame are we looking at? I mean, because we don't see this changing really anytime soon. So 
the long-term plan for this? Are you asking about the cross subsidy in particular, or well, just how the does budget this do the budget in general? Then how is that going to affect the cross subsidy going forward? Or what well, would we do about the discrepancy? Yeah, the cross. And unless they change the special ed formula, um, I think our cross subsidy is going to be what it is. We'll try to manage those expenditures as much as we can. But there's a there's a, a mandate called maintenance of effort, which means you can't decrease your spending in special ed from year to year. Now your in, your um, inflationary rate's fairly high, so you can try to manage the amount that you grow from year to year, the amount that your expenditures grow from year to year, but. You know we're we're bound to meet the maintenance of effort requirements, so that that limits a little bit what you can do in managing That's what I mean, your special. It's got to come from somewhere because we can't continue. <coughs> I don't know what school system can. Right. Yeah. So well, everyone. That's the that's exactly the question that should be answered at the legislature. So we feel like the two and a half million offsets some of that. Two and a half, the, the goal is to present a balanced budget. Now, if we, if I, um, two and a half million may not be enough to present a balanced budget in June. That's our goal. Um, but if we take a two-year approach, and, um, uh, so in June of 2020, uh, to have dealt with any structural imbalance that, that we have, the goal is to deal with it in that in that, in that time frame. Um, Three million may get it would probably get us to a pretty, pretty close to a break-even. Budget presentation in, in, in May and June, uh, but that's the goal. The goal is to present with to you a balanced budget every year. And so, what is it going to take for us to get there? The revenue side is somewhat out of our control. The expense side is in our control to, to some, you know, to a large extent. We can control some of the variables there. So that's what we're going to do. Mr. Chapman. So with the, if we're shooting for two and a half million, where would that put us in terms of the surplus percentage? Because um, I think we, as I recall, we dip below the board policy on that. Where would that put us back to where put us at? Well, this is a preliminary number, but um, right now that would show us about 12.5% right at, right at our policy level. We have some flexibility the next two years to, to make the changes we need to make and stay within our board adopted policy for fund balance. But we have to act now in order for that to be true going forward. Other questions, comments? So it sounds like you'll be bringing us at the next April work study uh, some recommendations and we'll look at them then and start to move through it. Thank you both very much. Thank you. We'll now move to our third um, discussion item, D3, which is the elementary program update. Ms. Paul. Students. And we are, that has been confirmed through 
our strategic planning process that has bubbled up as a request in some of our buildings finished buildings, as well as through the big sleuth that's been a request to have more physical activity at the secondary level um, the other big piece is the um, standards have been they're in place and MDE is providing training they began in January and they have sessions going through May and we intend to send our team of teachers to go and bring information back so they can unpack those standards and become more familiar and what that means on a daily basis as well as assessment and everything that's embedded within the new information. So big ideas, we told you we were going to look into the standards. We were doing a lot with the Active Schools Grant, um, a lot of emerging priority through the strategic planning process that by it is highly valued. Is there any questions that you have on where things are at with physical education? Dr. Newmaster. I'm just wondering, has there been a change? Because at least at the secondary level, it's based on what's required. How much does each student need to take? And then they have other elective choices. So has the basic amount that's required by the state changed? Um, no, they, they haven't changed, but they're under, um, right now they're under review. And so part of why we're going to send a team is that we're going to be looking at what any, if any, were any adjustments to what the standards are saying. A lot of, I think, what we're seeing is that a lot of physical activity, you can have set aside time and the value for it to be embedded because of, of mental health and things that are just part of um, having a day of, um, having activity in your day is good for learning good for engagement. So we're paying attention to both of those factors, both, both on the social emotional side and how that's been a priority and how being active um, through active classroom means that there's ways that teachers are getting students up and being active in addition to some of the more structured ways that we have physical education. But we will be engaged in hearing what what is coming out of the new standards. And so that's where we'll have a team be going to hear how that has emerged. Okay, so at this point we, we're looking for ways. I know elementary has discussed where does recess get put and things like that. But I'm looking at it more from the lens of somebody that taught in the secondary system for three decades. And, you know, electives live and die by who signs up and what's required. Yeah. And so at this point, there hasn't been a change at the secondary level. And we know that we want to encourage whether it's extracurricular or, you know, get up and move sometimes. <laughs> Are there questions? Okay, we're going to shift into art. Hey, good evening. I'm Jonathan Lockman, principal at Birch Lake, and we'll tell you a little update on art this evening. Um, when we came to in front of the board earlier uh, with updates about art, we mentioned that since 2008, the district has had the strategy of partnering with the White Bear Center for the Arts. Uh, where we have the local artists coming in through that group into our schools, um, doing lessons K through five. Uh, currently, it's three lessons on watercolors, two on drawing, and one on a multicultural paper arts and simple 3D uh, kind of lesson. And finally, we also share that, um, like the other, some of the other areas, there's a an effort to rewrite the standards for, for the arts at the state level. And Principal Schmidt will tell us a little bit what's happened since then. Mayor Schmidt, Principal Lincoln, uh, some of the updates from the fall just include that the uh, multicultural paper arts lessons that are in place right now all have a specific theme, multicultural theme to it, it's based per grade level. And what's really nice is that they took into account the Explorations Program, which is a multi-grade program, and they created a specific theme just for that. Uh, situation and all those themes tie directly into our social study of life curriculum, which is really nice. And also, just recently, from the Minnesota Department of Education, uh, they put a timeline now on when full implementation will take place, which is the year 21, 22, I believe. Yeah. And so that puts us on, on a timeline now as a district to get a team together next fall and start to explore the standards and, and see how we can implement them with full fidelity by that time. Any questions? Okay. 
music. Okay. Uh, Cindy Mueller, from Slim Otter Lake Elementary School. Um, when we were here in the fall, um, we had talked about John Langer and I are um, the liaisons for orchestra and for music. Um, and obviously there's a connection there. Our fifth graders, we have some stats that we have shared is roughly 51% of our fifth graders participate in the orchestra program. Um, and that was up roughly a um, little less than 100 students from the previous year. So it's a very successfully growing program. Um, but with that, we were facing some challenges um, in integrating it within the components of already an elementary programming. Um, and so we were moving into looking at doing some um, design thinking around how do we address the scheduling um, challenges related to a successful orchestra program. Um, and so um, one of the things we did is we convened a group of, it was um, general music teachers, um, orchestra teachers, fifth grade classroom teachers. Um, and then John and I met with them and we did the design thinking process of really empathizing and understanding, you know, what are, what are the strengths and what are some of the challenges. Um, and really being able to de define what was the specific challenge um, and really was related to the scheduling ensemble versus small groups. Um, and so we at least had a, a problem that we could really define and tackle. Um, and so now we're moving forward into that problem solving phase related to our <coughs> So um, a, a couple things sort of to add to that. Um, when I'm talking with orchestra uh, teachers, it seems like we're kind of leveling off with our numbers, so we're kind of expecting this to stay right around this number, which is sort of good as we, over the last few years, we've been growing. Um, one of the challenges with scheduling, of course, is all of our buildings are unique and different. Some of us are much larger, some of them are much smaller. So, you know, within that context, every school has to have a little bit of flexibility in there. But really, we learned that um, you know, scheduling ensemble out of like the music specialist is a really good um, way for us to, to schedule that because it pairs like music with, um, with, with orchestra. So we're able to meet all the same standards. Um, and it also then, um, uh, reduce the amount of core instructional time that students are pulled out of out of their out of their classrooms there um, as well. Um, one of the you know as we were model that as we worked with that like at, at our school and I know I think we've been practicing some of that in some of the other schools. One of the interesting sort of positive side effects with that is that some of our general music classes on that ensemble day became much smaller. And I went and I talked with one of our teachers and said, well, how is it working if you have a smaller group of students? And of course, you know, the teacher was, wow, this was really awesome because I could really dive into and work with those particular students and they had some unique interest and unique needs to which the teacher felt they could actually work with the kids to help um, you know, spur their interest and help them pursue some of their interests. So, you know, moving forward with, a, with that flexibility, we know we're going to continue to try to schedule you know, out the specialists as, as best we can with flexibility each building, just because we just know that, you know, depending on the size of our uh, schools and the number of students who are participating, really changes is, is uh, the, the amount of flexibility and how we can, we can schedule those during the school day. So, overall, I think it's a, been a really successful year. Um, we're really happy with the way things are Any questions for us about uh, general music and orchestra? I just want to commend the principals for looking at and trying to see an opportunity in the challenge because we had been looking at orchestra evals as a separate piece from general music and by bringing them together they could actually come to something that everybody had agreement on that it was the ensemble that was where the opportunity was to find a better solution for and they did such a good job of just talking with each other and, and finding ways to kind of stop looking at things separately even though there was a good purpose to begin it that way Where's the opportunity to improve the experience for students and staff? Um, and that was such a win-win across everybody that they had pulled together. All right, world language. Sorry. Oh. Excuse me one second. Dr. Nelson. Just one question from a longtime fan poster. Um, I'm glad to see Arvester back after like a 20 year hiatus because I remember when violin practiced across from Lake Air's library in the room. And that was a while ago. How is it, what's the plan? Because it sounds like you're really creatively planning. What's the plan as you look a year or two or three down the lane as orchestra and band merge? Orchestra and band in the middle school? Yes. Okay. Well, we, we talked, we kind of were unpacking parts of this when we began talking about this um, at the beginning of the year because 
it is back to that original design piece of why are we starting orchestra in elementary and then we're waiting to start band in middle school. But it seemed, and as Cynthia referred to, using the design thinking process, that was not the root issue. Um, and so I think what they've addressed is really getting at, um, at there's a lot of things working right now, and I think that the, the, the challenge that we thought it might be between orchestra and band really wasn't the root of the problem. And so I think the solution that they came to really did address how to have a robust launch to orchestra, and then at, at this time we, you know, we're still tracking and, and we're in conversation because a lot of the work in the next year and a half is around the alignment of elementary program to middle school. And as we change things in middle school, it has impact on elementary and vice versa. But for this year, we feel confident with the plan moving next year. Well, that's what I'm wondering. I mean, that's an answer. Uh, approaching things from all kinds of angles. But I'm just wondering the, the practicality of, is this the second year? I mean, I'm a little dense. Is this the second full year of orchestra? This is our third. 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 OK, it's the third. Fourth. Fourth. Yeah. So, so they have merged with middle school. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was my question. What happens in middle school at this point? Not that it will change, but what happens? I mean, any program is richer when you have more instruments and more kinds of music you can play. And then it's more complex as, now how do you blend all this? So it's a good question. I guess I'd like to follow up with you on that. I, I mean, I think what you're asking is a little more, is, is band, a band and an orchestra and then a blend of the two? No, I mean, I've seen this at the college level where people do both and at different schools. What I'm asking is, as we look ahead of a program that we've started, now it's, it's moving down the line. What's happened? So then, I, I, I would sort of, and again, just my lens from the measuring. Right, right. That, right. And with, with what I've seen, you know, continue to expand it, you know, in, into the middle school and into the high school, and, and, and my understanding is that continue, that continues to grow there. I think one of the things that I've seen change over the last uh, few years that I've been able to participate is um, when we first began, it was kind of like band and orchestra, and I know that when, when we met, it really felt like it was music department. Um, and I thought that was a very healthy adjustment in, in, in a thought process of non-orchestra and band all competing, but hey, we're, we're a well-rounded music department bringing good things to children. Um, it's hard for me to speak, you know, where they're at, at that transition level as they bring it into the high schools, but I know certainly you know, at the elementary school, and I assume they're moving into the middle school because our elementary teachers work closely with the middle school people. It's really, we're a music department bringing good things to, to all of our children. And I think um, that's a really healthy, um, uh, healthy and natural change from starting out with two programs to hey, we're all music and we're all for kids. Well, they're all a music department. And I'm just thinking, as we look ahead, whether it's solar arrays or orchestra or whatever, what happens as we, what did the music department envision? Because I assume they're the ones that created this vision. They envisioned both and, and of course, you have, Dr. Newmaster, as you've been in secondary, you know enrollment drives offerings. And so there always has been this concern of if we add orchestra, will it be the demise of the band? And then, or and just you do see board. numbers, you know, fluctuate a little bit, but both programs are viable and running at this time. So um, so I appreciate your question. And even, you know, recently I had a conversation with a fifth grade student at Otter Lake who's in orchestra and talking about, or are you going to continue that at the middle school? And she said, you know what, I think I'd like to also try band. So I think that's, so I think it's also, it gives those, it at least gives them an opportunity to experience it. And then again, we'll kind of a little bit that, that student ownership and agency about what do I want to do with this as well? And they have more than one option. Hard any choices with such a rich Miss Floyd? So are we still on a three-day cycle through all of these programs? Is that still staying the same through all of these processes that we're going through when we get to next year? It stays the same. So with the music standards, is it is it just music or is it something like in secondary school you can choose to do choir or you can do orchestra you can do band. Are you required in elementary to have to do music as in singing? You can't pick something else? So the music standards for elementary are more around like general music, right? And so they have choral opportunities within their music program, but it's a general music class. So they have experiences with, you know, with singing, with movement and dance, with different instruments as well. So it's like an all 
all-encompassing, really. So can orchestra take over that piece of it? If some kids decide they're not doing orchestra, but they're going to do music those days, that well, I cycle. Think, I think what you're understanding is their solution for ensemble. Well, that's what I was yes, trying to yeah, figure out. Exactly so, right. But they, would, they yes. wouldn't ever go into music. They would just no. do they the lesson and then ensemble. Um, no, they'd still be part of general music. And so what's in the six day? Well, one's in a six day cycle. So one's in a six day cycle, the, the class separates into an in ensemble and general music. And then the other day in that six day cycle, all together in general music. So, our, um, so the, the music teacher and the orchestra teacher collaborate closely to make sure all of the standards you know, are covered in that. Um, but then the pull outs, for, there's still pull outs for lessons? There's still pull outs for lessons. So, lessons. so I guess what I'm thinking is, is if, it's, if they're just doing orchestra, couldn't, they're just doing orchestra. So one, one of those days during the week would be ensemble, the other day would be lessons, and unless you needed that so other music. Um, that would be an increase in, well, not necessarily an increase. It would be the right same amount of time. You would just only be right. for focusing on one particular thing. Yeah. It would be a shifting, um, yeah, scheduling. It would be a scheduling. We have to. We would have to sort of look at the numbers because if you have 50 students who are taking small group lessons, you couldn't fit that into that compact 45 minute time. So we, you know, certainly. You mean all in one room? That wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> we do our best. <laughs> <laughs> we do our best. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it would be. It would be something we could look at. But, you know, just I mean, you know, as we, we talk about some of those kind of things. Just your number of students involved, it's hard to do individual lessons like that. You know, one of the things that we do know about the individual lessons and core core content is um, you know, our teachers try to change, you know, by a quarter when the student's being pulled out. So if a student has uh, their individual lessons, you know, on, on a Tuesday at 10 o'clock, it won't be the entire year, so they're not missing the whole thing. And then the teachers and the orchestra teachers um, are um, also very in very close communication. Uh, we know that there are some students who are who might be struggling in the content area. They will coordinate and say, you know, probably best to take this student at this time. Because we want to make sure they don't miss you know, this particular math lesson or these particular math lessons. So um, a big part of that individual um, small group lessons is, is, is kind of fluid and coordinating between the classroom teacher and the orchestra teacher to make sure they're not missing anything. Um, but in general, it seems to be going smoother. I know I can speak from you know, our music teacher because um, they specifically asked, you know, how's it going? So, oh my gosh, this is great. I know the music teacher, we're coordinating, we're collaborating. You know, the student is, they can do the inquiry projects and they're loving these ensembles um, as well. And I think we're value added. Always, of course, looking for new ways to, to think about that. And, you know, I'm scheduling is always, I mean, she went for one more thing. I'm trying to, to do a lot, but um, right now, um, we're, we're, we're putting along very well. And I think one of the big ideas to take away is as you heard about art and as you heard about FIAD and you look at the standards work and next year being a year that's going to be important for the review of those standards, when you pull one thread of this, it, it, it impacts all the other parts. And so next year is really aligning to be a year that we really need to be looking at a deeper look of how to maybe look at changing things a little bit more significantly. But, um, but right now I think that, you know, the, the solution that we have here is a really good one, and it's a way to provide better programming. But in the context of it's a whole program, you got to be we have to be thoughtful about when all the parts can come together, and we're really looking at any bigger changes in next year, maybe a year that we may want to be looking at that. So, all right, well, very much. Other questions? Okay. Hello, I'm Chris Strait, principal of Little Elementary School. And we're uh, talking about world language when we met with Joel in the fall. We talked about reworking the kindergarten curriculum to set higher expectations to better prepare our kindergartners um, for that continued language study. And the Spanish teachers and the Chinese also, so the world language teachers, um, also wanted to consider a K-12 alignment um, of world language offerings to provide um, exposure and access for those kids um, for in-depth language acquisition. And then they continue training and comprehensive input model. So, and then um, this year they have a continue, continue with that work. Um, they've revamped the first through fifth grade uh, curriculum to incorporate more specific cultural learning uh, targets within their curriculum. So, um, for example, um, if, they're, if, they're, if they're learning um, masculine, feminine, hermano, hermana, chico, chica, 
Um, they would tell a story that would be part of their, their, their Spanish curriculum. But they wanted to make sure it included a big part of what we're doing in elementary is also um, uh, cultural understanding. And so they specifically lined up different Spanish teaching cultures to insert in those curriculums and stories to make sure they're not all piling like just on Mexico or just on Spain, but to sort of broaden that scope and then broaden that, that worldview. Um, and then the other big piece that they've been working on uh, this year is really um, uh, all of the kindergarten standards have been rewritten to create some, some higher expectations and standards. Um, it was now going into it that um, that kindergarten learning experience was, it was soft and it was okay to, 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 to ramp it up and uh, uh, just accelerate that um, a little bit more. So all of those uh, learning targets um, and uh, curriculum has been adjusted in, in the younger grades to um, make it just a little bit more challenging for them. Um, so ongoing work, I know, with that K-12 alignment, I know um, one of the world language teachers um, you know, volunteered agreed to attend the, the uh, secondary world language um, meetings as well. So there's been some of those connections in the beginning of those uh, you know, cross-grade level uh, conversation, which is an ongoing goal for the world language department. Questions, comments? And then we wanted to, we shared with you that we had um, been looking at a new model in the, in the last year in terms of how we were doing media and reach services. And so we want to start with giving you an update of things that are going on this year and then things looking forward. Yes, Pete. Good. Thank you. It's your
starving children, so it's just really great things to partner change, partner, partnering up with uh, South Campus. But just to, you know, a kid comes back down to, we just even had more time with that one individual. That would be great. It would help you so much, so much more. I wonder what other details to give you an idea of how exciting it's become. Um, so we started the uh, space clubs after school to our media.
when you've got a media specialist less than half time, you're not using those wonderful spaces no matter what kind of furniture you have. So it's not, the things are great, but we need the people that create the connection and research supports it. Like Air Stands Alone and what they did to elementary media. We're functioning at secondary because kids are a better, you still have to be there. But elementary, we're not even there. So as we look at things, I hope we remember that and know our kids deserve better. We want them to have everything. But they used to have this and it's gone. So I'm glad to hear people say, it's great, they're there. Maybe you have time. But that's not good enough. So that's it. Other questions, comments, concerns? Thank you, Dr. Newmaster. I guess the one takeaway we wanted to, to bring to you is um, we're so excited about the strategic planning process and the number of people that were engaged, both at the district level and at each site. And each site, there is such energy and excitement around a lot of people that got together to create a vision for the direction of their school. And so part of what we're trying to take away from the pilot that we did was similar to some of the comments that Marge made of that when you have an instructional, an instructional leader in a building that has a relationship with teachers, that is there to really drive a hub of learning um, for the school, for the adults and the students, and that teachers are supported to try new things in their instruction, try things in a different way, that there's, there's something to that. And, so a lot of the empowerment that came from the, the strategic plan, it's also how do we keep connecting that with a coherent system and support that um, in terms of district resourcing. So we're, um, we're really, really just trying to wrap our arms around that because bless you, the, uh, the, the, there's a lot of energy and there's, there's natural alignment that has occurred between what came out in the district plan and what has come out across all of these uniquely coordinated site plans and so how do we really think about maximizing our resources in order to create that hub of learning in every school because it's to the benefit of the adult, adults and the students. So that's that's really kind of what we're wrestling with right now and we're um, going to hear about some thoughts we have as what involves you know, moving forward. But it's a, it's a good place to be here. And I know we've, part of our conversation today is about budget reduction and, like Mr. Mon said, part of it is just about making sure that we're really being thoughtful about resourcing our schools as the key unit of change to really bring about better outcomes for students. So we're excited about the work moving forward. Lots of lots of lot of factors to consider, but we're excited. Well, thank you very much, and thank each one of you for uh, your work. Really appreciate uh, influencing some of our youngest learners. So. I know there's a lot of energy in those schools as I've been out visiting, and um, all that comes from the work that you guys do. So thank you all very much. Thank you. So with that, uh, we will move into our last discussion item, which is the negotiations uh, strategy discussion. This portion of the meeting will be made close to consider strategy for labor negotiations, including negotiation strategies for developments or discussion and review of labor negotiation proposals. Conjunct, uh, 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 presumed Minnesota Statute 179A01 to 179A25. But I ask for a motion to go into closed session. So, Chair, I move to close the session. Uh, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, we will go into closed session and meet upstairs. Is that what we're ended? 201 uh, in five minutes. Is that five minutes for us? All right. We're in closed session.